Yeah, <clears throat> please share the screen whenever you want and we can see. Good, so hi everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to have the Daniel Bratan from University of Genova today, who will talk us about uh, dif diffusion in a magnetic field. So as usual, uh, let me say just before, please feel free to, to ask questions, keep your, your mics um, uh, muted and just whenever you want to ask a question, unmute yourself and, and go ahead. Please, Daniel. Oh, okay. Thank you, Daniel. Um, as you said, today I'm going to talk about diffusion in a magnetic field. Particularly, I'm going to work in two plus one dimensions. But a lot of the ideas that I discuss will extend to higher dimensions. Um, here on the side, we've got a little summary of what we're going to discuss today. Uh, I'm going to start off by talking about magnetic fields that are order one in derivatives. Uh, in particular, they vanish in the uh, equilibrium state. So I'll review some odd results and uh, related developments that came from them. And then I'll, I'll talk about something very recent that I did with people at Genoa and uh, experimental groups at Dresden and Genoa, which is an actual real material. Um, then I'll move on to my latest work, which is discussing magnetic fields that are order zero in derivatives. This is that they are non-zero in the equilibrium state. Before higher sort of hinting at what's coming hopefully in the not too distant future uh, on the archive. And I'll finish up by talking about sort of a grander idea, what, um, what these results from magneto hydrodynamics might suggest about hydrodynamics in, uh, in holography more than we know at the moment. Okay, good. So with that said, let's, let's get on with it. Uh, let me set the scene a bit. Um, it's a very reasonable question to ask, why should I care about magnetic fields in two plus one dimensions? Well, um, hopefully quite a few of the web, but there are um, also materials that are effectively plain materials. The stereotypical example here is graphene. And the magnetic fields, it's, it's actually relatively easy experimentally to get a constant magnetic field in a flat plane. Um, so that's useful because it's one of the few sort of experimental parameters that's very easy to tune. For example, if another one you might want to change is the doping of different uh, charge carriers in a material, but that's a lot harder. You have to go away, grow a new crystal, maybe the doping's too high, too low, the crystal shatters. With uh, an external magnetic field, it's uh, in principle, obviously experimentalists will tell you it's a lot harder than this, you can just go and turn the dial on some machine somewhere and it changes the strength of the magnetic field. There's also lots of very interesting effects associated with magnetic fields in two plus one dimensions. For example, I'm sure everyone here is aware of the whole effect uh, or suppressing superconductivity. Uh, perhaps people are less aware of anions. So these are uh, particles that exist in two plus one. Um, basically because of the different nature of the rotation group in that dimension. And they have neither integer nor half integer spin, but some fractional spin. And the way this works is you have some background magnetic field, and if your theory has a Chen Simons term, magnetic flux gets attached to these charged particles uh, in such a way that when you take one of the particles and move it around the other, uh, you, you describe the current loop, and the result is that the uh, spin when you go around is not one, you know, sorry, the change in the sign is not one or minus one, but some uh, overall phase. Okay, so that's, that's, that's sort of the experimental effects you might be interested in, or at least the system. But also, I mean, I, I should give my perspective as to why I like uh, magnetic fields in two plus one dimensions. Um, I think they're theoretically fun in particular because they don't break spatial rotation invariance, which makes things a lot more difficult normally. Um, and, you know, as I said, they have all these bizarre properties. So that's, that's magnetic fields in two plus one. Hopefully I've convinced you or at least made your mind open enough to uh, think that might be interesting. Um, but what, what does holography have to do with this? Well, okay. We're in the uh, applied uh, online seminar group here, so 
there's the standard answer, which is that holography is very useful as a test bed for, for um, looking at condensed matter systems because it's a whole new way of calculating things and it allows you to calculate things in theories where normally you wouldn't be able to do so. But actually, with respect to magnetic fields, holography has a, another nice feature. Um, so take, for example, the dionic black hole. In the dynamic black hole, using one of these horizon calculations, which I'm sure most of us have done, uh, you can compute the value of the electric, the thermal electric, and the thermal conductivity to all orders of p. It doesn't matter what the size of p is. It's a relatively straightforward calculation. So in that sense, holography is also you know, a good place to play with magnetic fields, because you can get exact results relatively easily in a lot of cases. OK, so that's the scene. Uh, hopefully, you see why I'm interested in these things now. Um, so let's now talk about what was done in the past. So we're going to go way back to 2007, when I was just finishing uh, my undergraduate degree. And there are a couple of guys who were interested uh, in a phenomenon in Cooper superconductors, which was the anomalously large Nernst effect. You might recognize these names, they're down here at the bottom. Uh, these were the guys. And um, what they thought might be the case, because uh, the point is that this enormously large uh, Nernst effect is also associated with the space diagram where you have the strange metal. In particular, whether if you look in the strange metal region, you've got the uh, resistivity going as T. So they put forward this idea that maybe what's behind all these odd effects in the strange metal phase is a quantum critical point hiding under a superconducting dome. I'm sure most of you have seen the diagram. I'm sure it's in a minute. Um, and that this quantum, quantum critical point is controlling all the properties that we, all the thermodynamic properties and the transport properties that we see. Um, as it's strong coupling, now we, we know but uh, the, I, I'm not sure it was appreciated at the time, but now we definitely know that um, a strong coupling, the, one of the best sort of uh, descriptions, one of the descriptions you expect to apply is hydrodynamics. If I'm to give a, a, a rough kind of intuitive idea of what that is in terms of a particle picture, uh, your particles are you know, strongly coupled to each other. They're interacting uh, you know, very, very strongly which means that when you make some perturbation of the system, it very quickly spreads out into a region. And you know, this is all related to scrambling times and whatnot. So we expect hydrodynamics to be a good description of uh, these strongly coupled systems relatively early on in their evolution when you make some perturbation. So anyway, uh, these, these guys went away and they wrote down a theory of hydrodynamics to try and describe this quantum critical point. Uh, I'm gonna give, uh, can I just check Daniel? You can see the, uh, the mouse here, right? Don't yeah, we can see the mouse, but we were also wondering whether you have a headset or something because there is a bit of echo. Uh, it might be the fan, give me one moment. Oh, uh, no, it's the room. Uh, yeah, that's why I was not interrupting you because, okay. I don't have a headset, I'm afraid. Okay, we can, we can, we can understand you, but I was... I, it's a, bit, for, it's a bit of an echo. I'll, I'll try turning my voice down slightly. If I get too quiet, please say. Yeah, also don't get too quiet. <laughs> I'll try and balance. Um, I mean, it's okay, I think. And we can see your mouse, I think. Move it again. Uh, yes, here. Ah, yeah, yeah. Okay, great. So um, here's one of the constitutive relations. It's for the spatial charge current. And you can see here a, a sigma naught, an incoherent charge conductivity, and here an alpha zero, which is an incoherent thermoelectric conductivity. There's also an expression for the heat current. But it turns out, because of relativistic invariance, that this is not independent of this. In fact, they can all be expressed in terms of a, uh, a sing the electric conductivity, the incoherent electric conductivity. So, I mean, the authors of this paper made a, a very big point about the fact, and uh, it was a very big point about the fact that everything can be expressed, you know, all the magnetotransport can be expressed in terms of one incoherent quantity that you need to define. 
So they went away and computed the, um, the hydrodynamic correlators, and you find things like the uh, longitudinal charge conductivity and the longitudinal thermal conductivity in the DC is zero. Uh, this is the uh, hole conductivity, the electric hole conductivity, it has this expected form. And this is the thermal hole conductivity, and depending on whether you want to subtract the magnetization current or not, you get S over B or S over B minus the magnetization over the temperature. It's just a, a definition of the heat current. And here we display, uh, I display the, uh, the correlator, that, excuse me, the correlator that you get from doing that. So the blue dots are actually data for, for the dynamic black hole. The blue dots are, are data you get by uh, solving the perturbation equations in the dynamic black hole. Uh, this, this purple dashed line, which is also here, is just all on top of each other, is the result you get from this paper, these papers, uh, the analytic result. And there's also a, a red line, which I'll explain in a moment. So this is a relatively low B, and you see the matching is perfect, it's spot on. Okay. Um, but when you turn up B, uh, what you begin to find is that there's a difference between the data, which is again, this, it's actually dots, but they're very closely spaced. There's a blue line here, and this purple dashed line, which is the result from the paper. Now, at, at the time, uh, what people said was, well, we only expect uh, hydrodynamics to apply when the magnetic field is suitably small with respect to the temperature. So maybe what we're seeing here is the fact that you've, uh, you're considering the magnetic field as much too large. Um, what I'm going to discuss a bit later in this talk when we get to uh, order zero magnetic fields, is actually that's not quite correct. And I will show you how to derive this result. This is our result this red line, which you can see in the hydrodynamic region, much better matches the data. Okay. Obviously, outside the hydrodynamic region, it doesn't need to match. And in fact, uh, the nice thing about Hartnell's result is that it goes to the uh, conformal conductivity, but that's not a necessity uh, of, of uh, the hydrodynamics. Okay, good. Um, so I actually wanted to show you as well that there's a, another difference um, that's sort of led us to this study, which is if you look at the thermal conductivity, these, these, these conductivities here, they're all fixed by symmetry principles. So if you have a system with, uh, that's governed by hydrodynamics, and there's a magnetic field of charged particles, you will find this, okay? as long as the only effect that's breaking the conservation of spatial momentum is due to the magnetic field. This is exactly what you get with this quantities. However, there is system-dependent information, but all that system-dependent uh, information for the magnetothermal transport is hiding in the thermal conductivities. So what I'm showing here is the difference between the, uh, the thermal conductivity you can either calculate which is the blue dots using perturbations in the, of the black hole, dynamic black hole, or the red line, which is the analytic results, again, from these papers. Oh, sorry. And you can compare that against uh, what you get from the hydrodynamics. And you see that there's a, a, a difference, okay? But these two, are, um, but there's a non-zero difference between what you get from the hydrodynamics for the DC thermal conductivity, and what you get from the actual holographic calculation. And again, the, the authors of these papers made the very sensible solution, uh, uh, suggestion that maybe what's happening is just that the magnetic field is, is too large. You're outside the magne uh, magnetohydrodynamic region. Again, what I'll show is that that's not quite right. And if you include another uh, incoherent conductivity that you didn't think might be there, then you'll be able to match the thermal conductivity to all orders in B. In fact, that's perhaps what you would intuitively expect for hydrodynamics, because you think of, or at least I think of, hydrodynamics as a low-frequency regime. And so you would expect it to be able to always get right the DC conductivities. If it doesn't, then maybe something's not quite right. Good. 
So that was 2007. Um, I'm going to, some other, you know, from this point, there were lots of studies of order one magnetic fields. I'm just going to highlight a few that I had some involvement in or I got interested in. Uh, please don't be insulted if, if I've not included, uh, you know, your work in here. There's, there's so much to review. Um, so after that paper, uh, people considered the nonlinear uh, fluids and they constructed a gauge gravity, uh, sorry, um, a fluid gravity uh, uh, duality between, you know, these fluids with the order one magnetic field, the order one and derivatives magnetic field, and, um, you know, gravity. Uh, they also considered parity violation, that's these guys here. And, you know, when you have parity violation, there are extra new transport coefficients uh, that are dissipationless. You also get interesting new effects like hole viscosity. And actually, that will be one of the questions later on with our study is um, when you uh, now include this um, incoherent hole conductivity, this incoherent charge hole conductivity, as you'll see, um, maybe there is now the hole viscosity as well, but we only looked in the diffusion sector, hence the title of the talk. So I, I can't give you a yes or no on that at the moment. Also, there have been investigations uh, uh, of magnetic fields in programme models. It's a little less clear here whether people are surreptitiously taking the magnetic field to be uh, order one in derivatives or not. You can certainly compute a lot of quantities with, um, with an order zero magnetic field, but when you're matching against hydrodynamics, there's often a hidden assumption somewhere where you take a scaling limit to match the hydrodynamics against the background. And as I mentioned before, these program models have also been useful for uh, uh, discussing anions, which is something I find quite interesting. And of course, as I've said, there's so many different uh, uh, papers in the literature I can refer to here, but these are all kind of holographic things. What about a real system? Well, I, my colleagues at uh, Genoa and Dresden actually went about uh, trying to find one. And so we, working with the experimental groups in uh, Genoa and Dresden, uh, I, I actually had, I, in the end I asked for a little sample, but unfortunately it's in the other room and I don't think I can go and get it reasonably. But I have in a little plastic box a sample of this material, so I feel like a real physicist every time I look at it. So uh, this is the material here, it's a high temperature cup cuprate superconductor. Um, now, uh, what Andrea, so Andrea Amaretti, my colleague, he was, he put forward this idea that Perhaps one can explain all the features that we see in these high temperature superconductors if uh, we take account in the hydrodynamics of the fact that they also have charge density waves at higher temperatures. So let me uh, explain a little bit about that. Uh, so there's lots of experimental evidence for this, um, that as you increase the temperature, what you find is your what is normally a through the peak in the conductivity starts to become offset from the axis. And uh, when you look at what might be causing that mechanism, I mean, here there's a, uh, there are examples where they use X-ray diffraction, they find experimental evidence for these charge density waves. Now, I'm not sure everyone uh, knows what a charge density wave is, so let me give a, a brief sort of intuitive Explanation. This go work goes back to 1955, so it's a very old idea. And so we'll just look at this little cartoon here. So here we have a, a one-dimensional um, model of, uh, of crystal. So there's fermions, uh, in, and these are the um, dispersion relations here. So there's fermions, and we will fill up to the Fermi level. Okay. Then what I'm going to say his name wrong, so please forgive me, Piers, uh, considered was that if you turn on a, uh, what happens if you turn on a lattice distortion? So here the lattice spacing is A. Now you turn on a lattice distortion of spacing 2A. So this halves the Brillouin zone from pi over A to pi over 2A, okay? Why is that an interesting thing? Well, now your Fermi level is 
at the level of the band gap, this little break here that was initially over here. Um, this is uh, an interesting thing because if you, if you look very closely at the edge of the band gap, you can see it turns down slightly. It's not uh, smooth across this break. So that means that uh, fermions that are sitting right at the band gap experience a decrease in their energy. So if you can, buy, if you can balance the decrease in energy from fermion sitting at the Fermi level against the uh, energy required to create the lattice distortion, then maybe the ground state is not one you know, where the uh, uh, lattice is sitting still, but in fact one where there's no overall distortion. And this was uh, this is a charge density wave. Okay. So, high temperature superconductors. There is evidence for charge density waves. Let's now try and build the charge density wave into a hydrodynamic theory and test it against uh, an actual material, the DC measurements from material, to see whether that is reasonable and it accounts for everything that we see. Um, in particular, uh, this material is the one we'll look at. Why? Well, it has a relatively high critical temperature, which, uh, sorry, relatively low critical temperature, which means you can go quite far down in temperature, okay? Uh, good. So, uh, what, what assumptions are we gonna make in our hydrodynamic model? We'll do exactly what uh, those papers I talked about from 2007 did, we'll assume there's a relativistic fixed point. We'll turn on a magnetic field that will treat as very small. So while it is constant, it's so small compared to other scales in the system, you can effectively take the scaling limit, and that there are no fundamental whole conductivities. Okay? With that in mind, these are our conservation equations or non-conservation equations. So here we have uh, the charge density and the entropy. Okay? And because we'll work to first order and fluctuations, you can assume the entropy is conserved. The entropy current is conserved. Uh, this is the uh, momentum here. And it is not conserved in part, in one part because of the magnetic field, which is here. Another part, we assume coherent mechanisms for the, um, the, the K of momentum. And then here, this phi i is, um, this is the, represents the charge density wave, okay? You can combine that phi i into other quantities here. So essentially it just takes the curl and the divergence of phi i in the spatial directions. You know, so di phi i and epsilon ij, di phi j, and that gives you lambda one and lambda two. So this, this is the other hydrodynamic equation. One way to think of it is this, the analog of a Josephson junction condition, you know, that you have in normal uh, superfluids and superconductors. So uh, that also we allow for some, some, uh, some decay rate here, just like we did for the coherent mechanism here. The summary of all that, so, those are the non-conservation equations, but the summary of all that is that the hydrodynamics ends up depending on, on uh, in the DC on four quantities. Uh, the charge density, the entropy, this sigma naught, which we discussed earlier, the incoherent conductivity, and this sigma tilde here. So uh, I, I think, yeah, we'll, we'll define sigma tilde in this way, that the DC conductivity is the sum of this incoherent one and sigma tilde. And sigma tilde you, turns out to be related to other quantities that appear in these equations. It's, it's not particularly illuminating. Um, but the, the important point, the, the point to really make clear here is that there are four quantities necessary to uh, specify the DC behavior from the hydrodynamics. Okay, so now let's go to experimental data. So this is actually something that Martina um, got for us. So she went to her laboratory and she did the things that experimentalists do that I can't pretend to understand too deeply. And she came back with the data I'm displaying here. So this is the resistivity, the longitudinal resistivity normalized to its value at 300 Kelvin. And you can see over a rather a large range of temperature. Uh, that is approximately uh, linear in the temperature, okay? 
I mean, so the K's and L's here are referring to different crystals that you used. I also haven't displayed it here, but you can show that the uh, resistivity is approximately independent of the magnetic field. So our, our first piece of data, scaling data, is that the resistivity goes like T, um, a constant in the magnetic field. Okay. Uh, it's another two pictures, uh, again, data that Martina managed to uh, gather. Um, this is the, uh, well, here you can see that there's a, a t to the four minus four dependence, uh, which we put here. And we have here a b squared dependence, okay. Um, there's also the cotan of the whole angle. Here you can see uh, that it goes up like uh, three halves. And again, I, there's a picture involving me. Hmm? Danny, sorry, maybe you said it, but what are the three sets of points, like L2, K10, and K7? Oh, sorry, yeah, I, I think I did say it, but uh, I'll okay. say it again. Right. They're, different, they're different crystals. Ah, okay, sorry. So, I mean, each crystal has slightly different properties. Uh, so it's different sizes and whatnot. Um, but yeah, it's, it's different crystals. Uh, this is the cotan of the whole angle, as I was saying. Um, sorry, I'm just getting back to it. And again, I haven't displayed the picture, but uh, it has this inverse B dependence. And finally, there's this kappa XY, um, which is uh, the, the thermal conductivity, the whole thermal conductivity. And you can see it has this uh, T to the minus three dependence from here and a B dependence here. Okay. So, that's all very nice, uh, but what does that tell us? Okay. So we have four unknown variables from our hydrodynamics, and I've just given you four pieces of data. So what you can do is you can fix the scaling of these uh, hydrodynamic variables in terms of data. So now everything is in the hydrodynamics is uniquely fixed. So you might say, well, great, and you haven't learned anything by doing this. Um, but there was, there's actually another measurement that Martina made that we can compare to, to see whether our hydrodynamic theory is predicting the right kind of thing. And you can probably tell by the slightly confident smile on my face that it matches. So let's look at that now. This is the Nernst coefficient, the one I mentioned earlier, as the motivation for looking at magnetic fields um, uh, the motivation for those 2007 papers. And you can see, um, using the information we have from before, the Nernst coefficient approximately scales as these quantities. And if you use the hydrodynamics, what it should tell you is that the Nernst coefficient scales as t to the minus 2.5. Looking at the graph, boom, perfect. So the, the point is that you actually over constrain because we've got data to over constrain the hydrodynamics. So what should happen generally is if something is over constrained, then you'll find that you can't uh, match. Unless you got the theory right, you can't match your theory quantities to the data. One of them has to be wrong, right? But here the system's over constrained and is giving us the right answer. So this suggests that this is a strong suggestion that this might be the right kind of thing. Now there are some um, some problems with this analysis in the sense that uh, for it to be completely conclusive, one of the things you should do is look at finite frequency. This is indeed something the experimental groups here in Dresden are doing now, um, but we'll have to wait for the results of that. I should also say that it's based on an assumption that uh, you might question because the uh, charge density wave is only known to really appear at higher temperatures. So assuming that it holds down to the quantum critical point is a relatively big assumption. But at least we can say that it's consistent, which is a non-trivial thing. It's, not, it's consistent even though everything is over constrained. So that's quite a strong statement. But again, we're gonna to have to wait until Martina has the uh, finite frequency data before we can say anything conclusively. 
Good. Right, so now we are moving on to the uh, cases of magnetic fields that are non-zero at equilibrium. Uh, and everything we did before when I referred to uh, the holographic answer or even the experimental answer, even, even if you had a constant magnetic field, what you should be doing at the end is a sheer, taking some scaling of that magnetic field so that it's small enough that you get the leading answer. But that, that seems odd. I mean, for the Dalek black hole, we know what the DC cond thermal conductivity is, and all the DC conductivities to all orders in P. So maybe you might be a bit uncomfortable with that. And that was actually the motivation for going back to the Dalek black hole and looking at it again. Um, so here, uh, one, of the one of the things we did was to go away and compute the Laurent expansion of the um, of the charge correlator about the hydrodynamic pole. So uh, uh, I may have to remind some people uh, of that complex analysis you did four years ago. You know, four years, four to ten years ago as an undergraduate student. The point is um, a Laurent expansion uh, uh, around uh, uh, an isolated pole looks something like the pole plus a constant, plus terms that are omega minus position of pole, plus terms that are that squared, that cube, so forth and so on. It's like a generalization of the table expansion. Um, here, it turns out to be very useful for the dionic black hole to take this, what otherwise looks like a bizarre combination of the um, pole conductivity, uh, the longitudinal conductivity. The reason for doing this is essentially S duality invariance in the holographic um, model. But it also has the nice property of, so in, in the downy black hole, you have two poles, actually, in the hydrodynamics. They have different sides of the real part, but the same imaginary parts. If you take this combination, you isolate one of those poles. So we went away and we, we uh, computed numerically the Laurent expansion around this hydrodynamic pole for the Downing black hole. And the results are, are shown here. Okay. Um, if you were to um, take the original 2007 results, what would you find? You would find that this constant term, which I'm calling the incoherent conductivity, I'll explain that in a sec, uh, is purely imaginary. Uh, with the uh, sigma naught being a lot less than uh, being sorry less than or equal to one. So let's have a look over here and see what happens. Indeed, uh, there's an imaginary piece, and for magnetic fields that are low enough, this is increasing magnetic field in this direction. You find that the imaginary part is less than one. So exactly, you you agree in the uh, limits that they discussed with those results. But as you start steadily increasing the magnetic field, different things start to happen. happen. So for low uh, values of the charge density, as you increase the magnetic field, you find that the conduct of the imaginary part gets bigger than one. In fact, for arbitrarily small b, uh, it's bigger than one as long as your b is bigger than the uh, charge density. But I remind you that in those original papers, they assumed that the charge density was bigger than the magnetic field to derive their result. Perhaps more bizarre is that there's a real part. Going again from here, uh, from the 2007 hydrodynamics, there's no real part. But we found a real part. So there's something that's not quite right here. The hydrodynamics is not quite describing what you're finding from the Darling by Paul. In fact, uh, if you trace this backwards uh, in, you know, in these correlators, what you'll see is that um, you need a constant term in so you need a um, you need an incoherent whole conductivity to appear in this piece to explain these results. So you don't see it here because I've plotted against the charge density, but all of these are linear in B, which I'm stating here. Um, and the red lines will be the results I derive later. So you can see they're a pretty good match. I'm just giving you a heads up. But the point is that um, 
the, uh, the original papers seem to be missing an incoherent whole conductivity. And we're going to go ahead and try and explain that now. Um, before I move on, let me make one more point here, which is um, about my use of the term incoherent conductivity. So uh, there's been a fair bit of research in the literature, uh, you know, uh, about these quantities. The idea is that um, when you start uh, including coherent mechanisms for, say, the momentum loss, then there is a part of your conductivity uh, that uh, really only depends on, that is independent of those coherent mechanisms. And that's an intuitive kind of idea. Um, it was formalized in, in several papers um, by Davison and Goudreau and um, others. Um, in the case when there is no magnetic field, because you can talk about the part of the charge uh, current that is not carried along by momentum. Unfortunately, when there's a magnetic field, this doesn't work anymore because they start turning into each other. So you have to come up with a slightly different definition of incoherent conductivity. So I, when I refer to incoherent conductivity in the case of a magnetic field, I'm going to refer to this constant term in the Lorentz expansion. Why do I do that? Well, well what does adding uh, you know, coherent effects look like? It looks like replacing the, um, the frequency by the frequency minus I gamma, where this, this accounts for the dissipation effects. So the bit of the Laurent expansion that's going to be independent of that is exactly this constant term. Okay, so that is an intuitive, I wouldn't say very precise, but an intuitive idea of what it means to be an incoherent conductivity uh, with a magnetic field. And of course, you are, you are free to completely disagree with that definition. Uh, it's, it's mine, so um, you can disagree as you please. Uh, can I, sorry, can I ask yes. a question? Yeah, sorry. Uh, Carl. Uh, hi. hi, Carl. Um, let me see. So, if you, what determines what is gamma, your capital gamma? Uh, I, well, for example, momentum dissipation. I try to just, it's very, it's yeah, not meant to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I understand it, but it seems to me now, if I, okay, okay. I'm but, not trying yeah, to be let me, let, me, let, let me ask the other way around. Mm -hmm. How do you define uh, omega hydro? You see, because you have a pole, the pole has a real part and an imaginary part. Yes. And you seem to have some method to, out of this imaginary part, you, you are, able somehow to single out the gamma. Why yeah. the gamma is not part of the hydro? And how yeah. do you make this unique, this division? There must be some, you know, you have this imaginary part in some way, you have to divide up in a gamma and the stuff which is not gamma. Well, okay, so I, 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 have, uh, I have a more precise answer and a slightly less precise answer. So let me, let me do the slightly less precise answer first. Um, what I had in my head when I wrote this down um, was that you have some uh, hydrodynamic model and initially there's no gamma ij dj mm -hmm. and then you turn it on and I was, when I say omega hydro here, I'm just referring to the bit with gamma equal to zero. But you are right, yeah. in fact the hydro mode uh, when you turn on these coherent mechanisms is, is exactly includes this gamma term. Yeah. So maybe this is a bad labeling. Um, okay. um, but that's, that's what I had in mind. You know, clear. What you said is of course, right? It works, but somehow it assumes that gamma is very small, right? That yes. is, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. And I, I have comments about that later, but one of the things that uh, will be the upshot of this study is that um, you can consider uh, magnetic fields that were larger than you thought because they're not derivative anymore, they're order zero, so they're in the background. And I have a question now about whether other terms that occur in, I, I think uh, it's, it's a universal name here, but in quasi-hydrodynamics, 
hydrodynamics with these broken charges, whether these um, terms can be also non-zero in the background generally. Um, that's actually something I, I really want to investigate because I think that's a very nice idea, but I, I don't know. So here implicitly you're right, I'm assuming gamma is small. Okay, okay. thanks. No, no worries. Um, thank you. Uh, okay, so my point was that something's amiss, we need to explain it. Okay, and I define the coherence conductivity. Great. Good. So let's go back to some of the things that were done in that 2007 paper uh, and learn some things. Um, so one of the um, uh, results from that paper concerns the ward identities and the relation between different uh, two-point functions. So I've given one example of them here. So this is the charge current charge current. Uh, correlator and this is the charge current heat current correlator. So if you think about it for a minute this implies something about the, um, the small omega expansion of these quantities. Oh as long as b is taken to be order zero in derivatives. Okay. In particular it tells you that uh, terms from here, sorry, yeah, terms from here appear at one higher order in omega as terms in here. I, I, I hope that's clear. So there's a crossing of the uh, Taylor series of these two objects between different value, different orders of omega. And it turns out that um, if you look at the, I mean, Hardell actually made this point, so I'll just repeat it, that everything can be expressed in terms of the um, AC, electric conductivity. So the uh, um, thermoelectric and the thermal conductivities, the ACs, can be completely expressed in terms of the electric conductivity, the AC electric conductivity. In particular, at small omega, which I'm gonna show I have here, uh, it begins as rho of B, that was the result we had before. Uh, this here is the thermoelectric Piece. Again, it's just really fixed by uh, thermodynamics. And then at order omega squared, you find that the model dependent information starts appearing. So that's this uh, thermal hole conductivity at zero, at zero frequency, and this longitudinal hole, uh, thermal conductivity at zero frequency. And I've, I've sort of plotted them here for an example B. Okay. So the, the takeaway from this is that uh, magnetothermal transport information is in the uh, charge conductivity up to order omega squared and small omega. Now, I, I think, uh, I don't want to put words in, in, in their mouths, but I think when they initially uh, were looking at this, because they were thinking of B as small, and in particular, omega going, B going like omega, um, they, they stopped at this point here. So they made sure everything matched up to order omega. But what we're going to do is ensure it matches up to order omega squared because of the, uh, you know, there is information here, magneto transport information here. Okay, great. So let's, let's go away and now do some uh, hydrodynamics. Um, this here is the conservation of momentum, spatial momentum. Um, it's, you know, just given in terms of the usual thing, you know, uh, the uh, uh, electromagnetic field strength acting on the charge currents. Here, this is the electric field. Oh, I've got two deltas. I'll, I'll remove one of them when I send it to you again, Daniel. And this is the spatial current. And so that's, that's one of your equations. And the other equation you have here is the uh, constitutive relation for the charge current. So this ij is a tensor structure, okay? Uh, but we all know because rotation invariance is conserved in the background, you can break this apart into two pieces, uh, a delta ij piece, but also because I'm not going to make any assumptions about whether b is, what the size of b is, you can also break it into a piece that's proportional to Fij. Okay. Um, if you go away and do that and compute the correlators, you'll find that the charge conductivity 
as this generic form. Obviously, it, is, it looks more complicated. Alpha 1, alpha 2, and alpha 3 are just, you know, uh, variables in terms of, you know, the things we had across the page, you know, cap H and the entropy and the temperature, um, the conductive, uh, the um, charge density. So our correlator has this general form, and we know what the expansion of this quantity is at small omega. It's this. So what one can do is match the small omega expansion from the ward identity against the small omega expansion of your correlator and extract the transport coefficients. Um, in particular, this is going to, because you have three pieces of data here, the leading term at uh, omega equals zero, uh, the next to leading order term of omega to uh, power of one and the omega squared, you're going to be able to fix all three of these quantities. So everything in your hydrodynamic correlator is completely fixed by the DC. There is no room for anything else. It's all done. And whatever you get, that's the answer. Although I should mention, I've been having a long discussion with Ben with us about this, um, but let, let's not, uh, in, in essence, whether you can have um, omega dependent corrections with these, I'm not sure yet. But let's for now take what I just said, that this is everything you can have in uh, hydrodynamics. Once you do that, you can plot the charge conductivity. This is the, long, the real part of the longitudinal charge conductivity. And voila, you have a much better fix. So this was the results from the 2007 paper. And you see it vastly underestimates uh, the value of the charge conductivity. The red line is much, much better. I, I accept that as the frequency gets large, it doesn't so it tends to become normal value, but there's no reason to expect that at all from the hydrodynamic correlator. It was just very lucky that it did so for this 2007 result. So in this, uh, someone speaking? Yeah, it's Blaise, hi. Uh, hi Blaise. Um, may I ask a question about the fit? Yes. Because from if I stare at this plot, mm -hmm. it looks like your blue line, your data, it's going above the red line and then back down below. Yes. Yeah, yeah, this is. So the, the match really is like until let's say point five, point zero five. Yeah, but well, I mean, there's yeah, no numerical error. Not really point zero two, uh, zero point two. Yeah, okay. I mean, I. I, I, I agree. Um, I, I picked a particularly large value of the magnetic field here, which you know, looked like it kind of matched. But you're right, it slightly underestimates. The, the point to evaluate omega is that uh, it's approaching the, the conformal value again, which is one, instead of hydro, which is sigma inc. Where... Yeah. So the, actually, the less you get, the smaller you get b, the smaller sigma inc is, and then the, the better the, pro, the, the agreement is. Yeah, you, you, you just hit exactly what I'm about to uh, show to you guys. Um, and so be, before you do that, so should I, because your, your sigma, your sigma, sorry, your whole incoherent conductivity, this is mm -hmm. something that's order B. Yes. And it multiplies something that's, that has one derivative in the, hydrodynamic constitutive relations. Uh, so should I think of it as including a transport coefficient from second, second order hydro, magneto hydrodynamics? And uh, if so, how do you know that there are not other uh, second order hydro transport coefficients that will also enter into the AC conductivities? So good. Um, the answer to that question is, uh, I would say is no, you shouldn't think of it as a second order term. It's a first order term. The magnetic field is a constant. It's not order one in derivatives. It's order zero in derivatives. That's the way I'm treating it. And so that, that's also part of why it was missed because um, in say the work, the parity uh, violating work, for example, they consider order one magnetic fields 
And you're right, it's, it's lower down in the derivative expansion. And then you would worry that other terms should also be included in, in the result. Um, and in fact, that's, that's something that I find very interesting. And it was something I was going to mention later, but I'll mention it now. Um, I'm not sure what the relationship is between this result where you treat the magnetic field as a constant. And um, if you say expand in small magnetic fields, whether the terms you get from that small magnetic field expansion do map on to exactly the terms you get from treating the magnetic field as order one in derivatives. Um, yeah, so I mean, it's, it's a good question. Um, I, I honestly don't know the answer, but here I would insist that one thinks of the magnetic field as order uh, zero in derivatives, because it's in the background, it's part of the background of the problem. And in the past, what happened was people took a scaling unit to match the two. And I've not had to do that. I just assumed it was a, a constant here, and I got better results. Uh, does that answer your question, Blaze? I'm not entirely... Well, I, I guess what I'm asking is, take the weak field magnetohydro that was written back then, mm -hmm. and then classify all second order corrections that enter into linear, linear hydro, Yes. then for sure this sigma whole ink would be one of these terms. And my Absolutely. question is whether there would be others. And have you exhausted all the possible yeah, I mean, of corrections that could enter? Ah, yes. And I guess an additional question that's related to your treating B in the background mm -hmm. is what, what if you had just used the expressions from weak field magnetohydro but evaluated all, uh, all thermodynamic quantities at non-zero B, which we know how to do using the rice and ocean black hole. Uh, so okay. how much of these corrections should I think of as corrections to the static susceptibilities that enter into hydrodynamics? Instead of having N at B equals zero, you take N at non-zero B. And would that yeah. improve the fit? Uh, it improves the fit slightly. I, I did do this. Yeah, I, I know what you're asking. Yeah. I did do this. It improves the fit slightly, but nowhere near as much as including an incoherent whole conductivity. The matching, uh, I mean, the difference between the 2007 results where you don't include B in the um, in these uh, static susceptibilities uh, is not that great. It's a very small difference to the way the magnetic field is. Also, the thermal conductivities are not matching at all, even if you include, if you modify the susceptibilities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm sorry I didn't understand the question first. Uh, but yes, that, that, that's, that's what I would say, that I, I checked there wasn't that much improvement. You need the incoherent whole conductivity. Okay, thanks. No, no, no worries. Um, Yes, so I mean, uh, good. So yeah, I, I would say that I've classified everything you can possibly have, because I've set the uh, spatial momentum to zero. I've assumed that you only have a single pole, so there's no order of maker corrections to here. And then all the constants that appear here, uh, you know, I'm not assuming anything about B. So I, I would suggest you have everything you could possibly have here. Um, Okay, good. Uh, so, as, as uh, Andrea was pointing out, you know, there's, um, uh, there's this point about matching the incoherent conductivity, what the uh, uh, hydrodynamic correlator does at large frequencies. So, there's this intuitive idea um, that I, I didn't actually know about, and um, Andrea explained to me, is that um, if you look at the charge correlator, um, at relatively large frequencies. Um, what you will see in that charge correlator is a feature. And this feature tends to sit where the incoherent, where the, uh, tends to sit, its value is at the, uh, where you get the incoherent conductivity. It's at the same value as the incoherent conductivity. So let me, let me give an example to explain more carefully what I'm saying here. So this is uh, a case where the magnetic field is a lot less than the charge density. 
Uh, here is the plot of the longitudinal conductivity as a function of omega. And, and again, you can probably see the blue dots on the purple line, everything matches very nicely. Um, if you zoom in uh, about here, what you find is this shape here. So there's actually a minimum prior to um, the conductivity taking the conformal value of one, okay? And that minimum sits exactly at the value, almost I mean, up to numerical area, error, obviously, uh, sits uh, at the value of the incoherent conductivity, okay? Uh, so that's, that's n uh, uh, a lot uh, greater than b. Uh, this is n a lot smaller than b, you, you find that the feature now becomes a, a maximum rather than a minimum, okay? And again, here we have the conductivity as a function of omega. I've chosen these values very small so the partial result and our result match each other nicely. And here, something happens uh, when b is approximately equal to n, but there's no clear maximum or minimum. I'm going to summarize these in a sec. I'm sorry this is confusing the moment. Um, so let me summarize them to make it a bit easier. <laughs> so um, this is the uh, charge density here. Um, this is where the charge density is equal to the magnetic field. I pick some value of the magnetic field. So this is the flow of that minimum. So a very low um, uh, charge densities, a minimum tends to one. And it stays mostly at one as you increase the charge density until you get to the point where rho is approximately equal to B, okay? Here, rho is greater than B, and this result is our result, the incoherent conductivity. Here is the result from the 2007 paper. So you can see it's quite, an underestimation of, of the value of the incoherent conductivity and simultaneously the position of the feature. So that's, that's the flow of the minimum as a function of the charge density. Here, you can also see the maximum. Okay. So these blue dots are the flow of the maximum and the red line is once again our expression for the incoherent um, charge conductivity. And you see it's, it's an excellent match Eventually, when the, uh, when the magnetic field gets too large, it obviously doesn't match. But for moderately big magnetic fields, it, it does match. In fact, it matches much better than the 2007 result, where the uh, incoherent longitudinal conductivity is bounded above always by one. Here, you, you explain this fact that, uh, sorry, that, that's a point I should have made earlier, that, the 2007 result, the longitudinal conductivity is always bounded above by one. But if you look at the data, sometimes it's bigger than one. And our, our result matches on exactly to that value. So I, I would take this as very good evidence, uh, you know, very good supporting evidence for the existence of this incoherent whole conductivity. I'm sorry I've not given the expressions, but there's a reason for doing that, that kind of long and ugly and very unilluminating, but you can go to the paper, they're available there if you really want to look at them. Um, there is something... May, may I interrupt again? Of course, please. If you go back a couple, so this feature, so go back again, yeah, this feature, this maximum or minimum, so you say mm -hmm. that it's approximately sitting at sigma zero? Uh, yes. Right, so that gives you some kind of estimate for the scale omega over alpha, where you might expect your hydrodynamic description to hold. Perfectly, yes, absolutely. How does this compare to your to the previous plot that you were showing us, the one that we were just discussing just a bit before? Yeah, that one. Where is that scale sitting for these particular values on this particular plot? Okay, so this plot here, yeah, is, uh, oh. So That's is it point. all the way to the to the maximum or before. Yeah, I would say the magnetic field here is a bit too hard to see it. Uh, it's, it's in a slightly lower magnetic field, there's more of an overlap between the, uh, the red line and the blue. Um, so yeah, I would suggest that I pick the magnetic field too large here. Um, sorry about that. 
but yeah, so let me show you here. I mean, this is, these are essentially the same plots as this, only in a logarithmic scale instead. And um, I mean, the feature we're talking about is here and in this case, and here in this case, hidden under everything. Um, but I, I picked the magnetic field low enough such that, you know, this is a good match. There is still a, a difference between the two. Mm -hmm. But it, it's, it's a good match at this point, a better match than one, which is what you get from the old result. Uh, yeah. I, I, uh, is that sort of answered what you're asking, Blaze? Or? Yeah. Okay, great, great. So yeah, I mean, actually, I'm, I'm glad you asked that place because uh, I was about to get on to a point that still really kind of bothers me about this whole thing, which is to do with the quasi-normal modes. You know, uh, there's a lot of work in the literature very recently um, where they're um, looking at this resummation approach. Uh, this is uh, essentially what one does is I'll go with uh, well, with this done scheme, is you uh, linearize hydrodynamic equations, you match the transport coefficients against the flow of the uh, hydrodynamic pole, which is the pole that's closest to the origin. And then by looking at how those coefficients grow, um, you can say where the hydrodynamic series converges. And in fact, what you find is that this hydrodynamic series tends to not converge when uh, I'm talking, I'm doing it here at finite k, when the diffusive pole hits a non-hydrodynamic pole. Okay. Um, there's, there's lots of really sort of interesting studies about this. But the, the, the point I want to make is the following. I, in principle, I fixed everything that one could have in hydrodynamics. And still, if you look at the uh, quasi-normal mode, uh, what you're finding is that there's a difference between the numerical quasi-normal mode and the result I calculate. This is the real part over here, and this is the imaginary part. Now, I want to understand why that is. So one thing you might be tempted to say, and this is one avenue I want to think about, is that how do you, you can ask how you fix uh, transport coefficients in hydrodynamics. And I chose to fix the DC uh, conductivities. I, I said, whatever happens, we have to get the DC conductivities right for all biomedicity. What you could have done instead is said, okay, I'm happy to get those DC conductivities a little bit wrong as long as I always get the hydrodynamic pole correct for all orders of B up until I presume the, uh, the point where it collides with a, another pole. Um, and I, 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 at the moment, I can't tell you, and I, I think this is an interesting question, as to what's the best way to do this? It might be the case that even that's the wrong way to think about this, Maybe what uh, magneto hydrodynamics is doing here is telling you, actually, I still can't, even with this incoherent pole conductivity, you still can't have arbitrarily large magnetic fields. You can only match the magnetic fields in some, up to some order. And that way, I, I think you should be able to get more of the quasi-normal mode and, uh, you know, the uh, DC conductivities up to some order in B. Um, but it's, it's very, very unclear to me uh, what the final answer is. And that's actually one of the reasons I want to start looking more into uh, these um, resummation approaches that people are talking about. Because um, maybe it becomes clear when you're, say, one thing you could do is try and analytically continue the dionic black hole to uh, you know, complex magnetic fields and look for poles in that plane. Uh, and then you might see that the hydrodynamic series is only convergent in some region. And one shouldn't trust, you know, uh, the results to, to, to arbitrary B. 
Um, but honestly, at the moment, I don't know the answer. But I think it's a very interesting thing to look at. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, let me uh, give you a heads up about some future results that will be coming out from the uh, group at Genoa. And obviously, Daniel's smiling because he's been working on these too. Um, so, I, here's a, a couple of plots. What we're interested in is going back to the charge density waves um, with magnetic fields and uh, seeing what happens if, if you treat the magnetic field now as truly a constant in the background, the same way that we did with the dynamic black hole. What I've shown here is that there are some features to explain in the, uh, in the correlators that we've got so far. Actually, this blue line, uh, this, is, this, is at, uh, this blue line here, is the result you get from treating B as order one in derivatives, if I remember correctly. Um, but you all, regardless of what order you treat B, you often find that the uh, charge conductivity looks right, but you will won't be able to match the thermal conductivity. So looking at the charge density is not necessarily the best way to tell if there's a difference. Um, but the features we have to explain from the uh, hydrodynamics, these are spontaneous breakings uh, of translation effects. So you have some scalar that takes um, some background values spontaneously, is that there are two poles. That's very different to what we had in the uh, dionic case. Um, in essence, going back to the thing that Carl was talking about, because there's a mixing between gamma the, the decay from gamma and B. And so you end up with two poles with different amounts of these effects. And I'd like to understand, um, hopefully we'll be able to say in the not too distant future, how to extract the different effects from these poles. In particular, can everything once again be determined in terms of DC data? That's not clear to me as a, uh, a question I would like the answer to. But hope, keep your eye on the archive, hopefully in the not too distant future, although it's taken a very long time so far, uh, we'll be able to give you an answer to that one. Okay. Finally, I would like to... May I, may I ask okay. a question about your question? So the DC conductivity, mm -hmm. so let's say I consider the full charge, current current correlator. Yes. This is written as a collection of poles yes. plus some analytic pieces. Yes. And if I take the zero frequency limit, the residues, yes. all of these poles are going to contribute plus mm -hmm. the analytic pieces. Yes. And so the DC conductivity is a very complicated sum of all of these different contributions that come, that come from many, yes. many, I... many, many things. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, Hydrodynamics is a theory of, well, at least normally only gapless poles, but you may try to augment it by including some gap pole that sits parametrically closer to the real axis than all other poles. So I would say by assumption, you're going to miss some of these contributions. And you're just hoping that you're working in a regime, or you're, you're making sure that you're working in a regime where you can neglect them. I so when but when you say that you want to determine everything in terms of DC data, mm -hmm. aren't you like putting things into the into the hydrodynamics that you shouldn't? Because somehow you're bringing back all information from all these all of these UV poles into your infrared theory without augmenting it with those poles. I, I, I and I have trouble seeing how this is well defined. Okay. So yes, I, I think that's a perfectly justified. Uh, uh, Thing to worry about, but I so we hopefully agree that if you take B small enough such that the hydrodynamic pole is close to the origin, then you can essentially um, well, that the rest of the information from the other poles is sort of damped out. Do we agree on this or, or do we disagree? Well, that. I would say in some cases I would agree, in others not necessarily. It kind of depends on what the spectrum of poles is. Right, okay. But uh, 
sure. Um, but um, it's true that if, if the cyclotron pole that comes from turning on the non-zero B is distant enough from all of the other poles that sit at, say, order temperature, then yeah, sure, that would be a, yes. a good thing okay. to do. So I, I, would, I would ask one to define distant enough. Um, therein lies the problem. Um, it seems like with the dionic black hole, distant enough was bigger than you might have thought it would be. Um, again, that's, that's uh, a, a statement based on qualitative matching of things, I would say. But I, I don't, my, my problem isn't really with that statement, because I think you can always augment the range where the hydrodynamic theory you're writing down is matching to you know, whatever correlator you're looking at by including more terms in the hydrodynamic expansion. Yeah. So you'll improve your match by doing that. Mm -hmm. However, you seem to be doing something different. Because now you're matching the DC data, and the DC data knows about everything. Yes, All of the expectations. Because these, these formulae we have from holography, they're non-perturbative. They're just exact. Yeah. So I would not expect them to hold if I'm trying to compare to hydrodynamics. At least not exactly. Especially if I'm breaking a hydrodynamics, strictly speaking, by including gap pole into the hydro. I mean, I, I, I feel that, uh, that issue. I, I would say that normally in hydrodynamics, you do match the DC values of things. And if you don't match the DC values of things, you worry. You're right that I'm going in the opposite direction. I'm using the DC to fix the hydrodynamic correlator. Whereas normally what you do is you get the hydrodynamic correlator and you see that it matches the DC. Uh, and if it doesn't match the DC, you have questions. At least for simple momentum relaxation, we know that this is not right. Yes. Uh, that it wasn't something. working out like that. You were not matching the hydro. You need to be more careful and include higher order corrections. But now, it could be that the case of magnetic field is a bit special and you can get away with matching DC conductivities. Mm -hmm. but. Uh, I don't see how this is going to be true of any any type of generic quasi hydrodynamic theory. I think magnetic field breaks things in a very specific way. I I think the answer is yes. In the sense, uh, in the spontaneous case with no momentum relaxation, you 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 can I guess, but as soon as you switch on momentum relaxation, you you cannot express everything in terms of DC data for sure. But here you have two peaks. So you have momentum relaxation, no? Uh, yeah, I think the 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 figure here is not uh, is, is is a little bit misleading. So in in order to the point is that in uh, when you have no momentum relaxation, you can express like uh, gamma one uh, and uh, gamma one uh, all and all this translocation in terms of DC data. But as soon as you get momentum relaxation, you have this capital omega that you always get, that you never, you will be never able to determine uh, in terms of DC data. So you need the poles, and uh, then you are just getting the, the lowest poles, and in some in some sense you are assuming that hydro holds because you are just uh, taking the low, the two lowest poles. But wait, so these two poles, we agree that these are the magnetoplasmon and the pinned magnetophonon. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, these, are still gapped, these are still hydrodynamic excitations that previously were not gapped and that now are gapped. Yeah, yeah. In contrast to all of the other poles that are sitting further lower in the in the lower half plane, and which in principle might also contribute to the DC mm -hmm. conductivity. But if they sit sufficiently far down, then this contribution is negligible. Yes. Yes, I think they sit, uh, I mean, at least in our regime, they sit really far down. That's true, yeah. for sure. So, yeah, so as long as you do that, then you're fine. Yeah. But this is not going to be true, generally. No, I think... I, I, think I mean, I, 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 that might be uh, exactly what's behind the non-matching, the uh, quasi-normal modes I was talking about. I mean, um, yeah, I, uh, generally, fine. But... I have hopes that in, in specific situations that you will be able to match things using DC data for other quasi-hydrodynamic systems. Another way of 
phrasing this is that say that you take B now in this in this system, you take B to be extremely large. Yeah. Then your cyclotron pole is shooting off to minus infinity and will essentially cease to contribute to the DC conductivity. And you'll find that you can approximate the non-perturbative DC conductivity just by looking at the residue of the first peak. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I think you're right. It's just, uh... That's just because that pole has you know, gone to the UV. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay, I'm gonna have to think some more about it. <laughs> Thank you, please. Maybe Danny, maybe try to. to I mean, it's twenty minutes. Oh, so. uh, I mean, I'm coming to my last slide. Okay, so. maybe try to conclude. <laughs> okay, uh, so I didn't realize we've gone over time. I apologize. No, um, no, there was plenty of questions. I, mean, I was just uh, like. It would be nice to get some conclusions. Yeah, so the, the conclusion is that, uh, the, the small conclusion is that one should maybe uh, include uh, a whole conductivity, an incoherent whole conductivity proportional to B in one's hydrodynamics if you want to match things properly. So now there's lots of fun to be had, for example, using correlated probe brains, um, which you know, it's very easy to get the correlator again, and you can do this exact Lorenzo expansion and determine whether there's a piece that goes like B, or you know, whether there's an incoherent hole conductivity. Um, and that perhaps uh, hydrodynamics with this magnetic field uh, is well defined in uh, regimes of B you otherwise thought it wasn't. So that's the small takeaway. The big takeaway is maybe. Quasi hydrodynamics is defined in regions that you didn't expect it to be well defined. So you get better approximations than you would otherwise have expected. And this, I mean, we, we just had a talk about moment and dissipation, but there's also things like probe brains or anion systems. All these things are quasi hydrodynamic systems. And the question is you know, um, if you treat the parameter responsible for breaking your symmetry. So for example, that was B in the case of momentum in the bionic black hole. Uh, it broke uh, um, conservation of spatial momentum. If you treat it truly as something that is non-zero in the background, so you're not doing the scaling limit, which was essentially behind everything that was done before. Um, can you get a well-defined hydrodynamics does it match uh, the correlators that you get from holography better than you otherwise would have assumed? And that's a question I, I think is really sort of like a research program that's really worth looking into in the near future. Now, with that said, uh, thank you very much. <laughs> sorry, I went over time. No, don't be sorry at all. There was plenty of questions. Thanks a lot, Danny. And uh, please, people, Feel free to ask questions and make comments. Um, can, can I comment about like the the, the word magnetohydrodynamics? Maybe oh. I should I should wait until uh, until the, the recording is off. But uh, so <laughs> I, I I mean in the so so I think in the the normal magnet I mean there, there is like a word that that say magneto transport and magnetohydrodynamic and and I think. MHD in, in the typical sense, like that's the one that plasma people use. This is the one where magnetic field is actually, it's actually dynamical. I, I'm sorry if I misled you into this talk. <laughs> no, no, uh, no, no. I mean, I, I already seen it in the paper, but like I, I was confused, like whether is it, it's a magnetic field dynamical here or is it just the magnetic transport? No, like no, quick, magnetic right, you, you probe it, with, where, where basically you, 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 you force the fluid with the strong magnetic field. Yes, yes, exactly. Uh, I mean, that's, that's also the situation that you find in a lot of condensed matter experiments, right? You have an external yeah. magnetic field. But I agree the terminology is not particularly good. Uh, do you have a better one you might suggest? I think magnetotransport is what people used before, but, uh, okay. and, and I, think, like, I think that there's magnetohydrodynamic kick in in some, some, some papers, but 
but then then it it's get confusing whether is this the one that past some people use or is it the one that well that John and Cole use. Well, I'll, I'll see if I can get Daniel to change my uh, abstract to like that. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> and, and, and also, also, can I comment about the, the probe brain case? Mm -hmm. So uh, there is a paper by, I, I think by uh, Andy Lucas and I think Chen Lin. Like with, I know exactly which paper. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. So, okay, I mean, I have nothing to, to add if you know about that already. I do know about that paper. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think they work at zero magnetic fields. I don't remember now. Um, but that's exactly one of the systems I wanted to look at to do exactly uh, the same analysis, essentially, one does for the donate black hole, because probe brains are particularly nice when it comes to computing things with magnetic fields. And um, so one can then look at this probe brain model, and I, I even gave away the diagnostic you can use, which is to take the correlator, do a numerical Lorentz expansion, which there's, um, I forgot to mention that there's a really good macro in Mathematica called N residue, which does this for you. you just um, got to make sure you've got your numerical pole, right? So you use N residue to compute the Laurent expansion around this pole. And you look at the constant term and you ask, is there a real part? If there's a real part, uh, as proportional to P, you probably have an uh, incoherent whole conductivity. So I, I, yeah, I think that's worth looking at. So maybe, maybe as much, so when you're talking about the probe, uh, making comments about the probe brains, is it because you want to consider the the momentum non conservation of probe brains as similar to a constant magnetic field? Or what is? Uh, no, I want, I want to genuinely turn on a magnetic field in those cases. But ah, okay, because probe brains already have this strange. Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah, exactly. And um, actually, there's uh, just to plug one of my older papers in this regard. Um, I, there, I've got papers in the past on looking at anions uh, yeah. with from the program models, and you can use. Oh? Sorry. Ah, oh, sorry. I thought someone was talking. No, no. Oh, at least not. Uh, and you can use SL two Z dualities um, to to take the non program model model and produce a model of anions. And there you can find that you can move the peak by dialing the churn Simons parameter. But I still, I mean, while you can control where the peak is positioned, it's still not clear to me how this is related to momentum dissipation, which is one of the sort of the things that um, that uh, people are interested in for the program because you're exactly right that they have already inherent in them some kind of dissipation. Whether it's momentum dissipation is also not clear because um, you know you sort of separated the degrees of freedom of the program from the background, and that's that's where the momentum perturbations would be. There's a, there's a lot that I, I think is still not clear in that scenario, but it's totally worth looking at. And as I said, there's a very simple diagnostic to determine whether there's an incoherent whole conductivity or not. More questions or comments? <clears throat> Nick is still unmuted, but I don't think. Uh, I, I'm not sure, but I'm thinking whether I should ask this or should I wait until the, the session is over. Maybe you could ask it now. So, like, so, so if you have hey, a you want, me, I can, you want me to stop the recording? <laughs> well, okay, fine. Uh, no, no, no. Okay, I just, I just wonder, like, if you, if you have a incoherent whole conductivity, like, so are you assuming that there would be like additional almost conserved current? And, and I mean, do you, do you have like you, you you thought about like what what would it mean? Why additional? Yeah. Uh, okay, I'm not sure I, I misunderstood the point, but like it, it uh, like the fact that there is additional I, I peaks, would say like simply, if you have Ji and you assume yeah. that forget about momentum, 
assume that momentum is conserved and then the you know momentum decays quickly then and and you could build your hydrodynamics with gradients of say chemical potential and you had a b field that violates parity then you would naturally write some matrix that like j i is sigma i j grad j mu right mm -hmm. so this is your incoherent co the you know your your conductivity matrix sigma hat would have a diagonal part and a not diagonal part and then yeah, that okay. has nothing to do with extra conserved currents or anything like that it's just that you're breaking parity and so this term is allowed and then my comment okay. earlier in the talk was that even in the weak field like need to hydro or my need to transport however you want to call it that term would precisely show up at second order in derivatives because that's one of the terms that you're allowed to write it's just I see, I see. by the 2007 people, this is second order in derivatives. Yeah, so, I okay. agree. I told us they didn't write it, and they probably didn't realize at the time that this was important to get a good match to the thermal conductivities, etc. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I had exactly this conversation with Pavel because he asked me how it was different to his um, parity violating case. And uh, in the parity violating case, you, you in the holographic model, you have these um, these Chern times terms. So you have a fundamental breaking of parity invariance. Here, your microscopic theory doesn't break parity invariance. It's only the con as a consequence of the magnetic field that parity invariance is broken, and that would be in their model exactly your order d squared. Uh, partial squared, exactly as Grace says. I see, thank you. Any more questions, comments? Okay, we've, we've had plenty. So. Okay, good. So. <clears throat> Thanks everyone. And as usually, uh, as usual, I will just leave this open in case people wants to keep discussing, which I was happy to see that sometimes it has happened. So I will stop the recording now. But let, let me just say that in a week we have a colloquium by Paul Romatsky. <coughs> so, uh, so 